This is Dr. Nadeem from the Department of Neurosurgery, Nimhans, Bangalore. Today I'll be discussing about the endoscopic anatomy of sphenoid and ethmoid sinuses. The discussion will proceed in this way. First I would be describing about the external nose. Then we will focus on the nasal cavity predominantly on the lateral wall along with the paranasal sinuses. The septum and its clinical implications will be dealt. Uh, the cadaveric anatomy and the endoscopic anatomy will be described hand in hand and the relevant bony anatomy will also be discussed whenever necessary. At the end we will try to revise with an endoscopic video. External nose actually is a osteocartilaginous network. It consists of the nasal bones which unite in the midline and inferiorly we have the cartilaginous part formed by the upper lateral cartilage superiorly. And inferiorly we have the alar cartilage. The midline is mainly contributed by the septal cartilage which forms the septum and laterally many small cartilage known as lesser alar cartilage contribute to the external nose. Coming to the nasal cavity proper. Nasal cavity is actually a transversely flattened structure. It is broader at the base and once as one goes behind it narrows down. It has a septum dividing it into two parts. It consists of a roof, floor, lateral walls and two opening which are anterior and posterior. The anterior opening of the nasal cavity is also called as the nasal aperture. It is triangular in shape and consists of nasal bone superiorly, ascending process of the maxilla on either sides, then palatine process of the maxilla inferiorly with anterior nasal spine in the midline. Coana is actually the posterior opening of the nasal cavity. It is bounded superiorly by the body of sphenoid. Inferiorly we have the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. Midline is contributed by the vomer. And on either side laterally we have the medial pterygoid plates. Same features can be appreciated here in the articulated skull. That being vomer in the midline. That is the horizontal plate of palatine bone. And on either sides we have the medial pterygoid plate. The lateral wall of the nasal cavity is actually formed by eight bones. They are as follows. It includes the frontal bone, ethmoid bone, inferior turbinate, sphenoid bone, maxillary bone, palatine bone, nasal bone and uh, some contribution is also seen from the lacrimal bone. The roof of the nasal cavity is actually formed by the nasal bone anteriorly and posteriorly we have the sphenoid bone and the central portion is actually contributed by the cribriform plate along with the frontal bone. The floor on the other hand is formed by the palatine process of the maxilla as you can see here in the articulated skull as well, the floor is formed by the palatine process of the maxilla and posteriorly we have the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. The paranasal sinuses mainly include anterior group consisting of maxillary frontal and anterior ethmoid and posterior group consisting of posterior ethmoids and sphenoids depending on whether they drain anteriorly or posterior to the basal lamella. Pneumatization of sinuses have a typical pattern. Maxillary sinus is present at birth and makes its radiological appearance at around 3 to 4 months. It attains adult size by 15 years of age. That is a maxillary sinus. Ethmoid sinuses are also present at birth, but however, radiologically they can be appreciated at 1 year of age and adult size is attained by 15 years of age. Though sphenoid sinuses are not present at birth, but they undergo pneumatization, uh, 
and by 4 years of age one can radiologically appreciate the presence of sphenoid sinus and an adult size can be obtained at around 20 years of age frontal sinus are actually the last sinus to get pneumatized and one can appreciate frontal sinus radiologically by 6 years of age coming to lateral wall proper the initial portion of the lateral wall consists of skin and hair and this area is called as the vestibule. There is an area covered only by the mucosa which is called atrium which shows an elevation which is formed by an anterior ethmoidal air cell called as the agar nasi. It is behind this agar nasi that we find three scroll like structures called as the inferior turbinate behind which we see the opening of eustachian tube. Then we have the middle turbinate and superior turbinate all of these enclosing the corresponding respective meatus underneath them. In order to see the nasolacrimal duct, we need to remove all the other turbinates and uh, we need to expose until the lamina papyracea laterally. Then we can see the nasolacrimal duct here lying anterior to the maxillary sinus. It opens below the inferior turbinate and it extends between the lacrimal sac above and inferiorly it is bounded by the hasnus wall. Though the inferior turbinate has a linear attachment, anteriorly it shows a bend and that is the apex and it can be used to identify the nasolacrimal duct opening in endoscopy. As you can see in this diagram here, it is a diagram of left nasal cavity that is the inferior turbinate that is the inferior meatus, we have an opening of nasolacrimal duct near the apex. If we are not able to appreciate it, one can press the nasolacrimal apparatus and uh, one can see the flow of tears through the cavity. In a coronal uh, CT, one can appreciate nasolacrimal duct in this position. Coming to middle turbinate, middle turbinate is a part of ethmoid bone. And ethmoid has a lot of features within it. It has a crista gala and cribriform plate within it. As you can see here, this is the crista gala, and the surrounding part is the cribriform. It articulates with the frontal bone all around. The lateral wall that you are seeing is the lamina cribrosa, which covers the middle and the posterior uh, ethmoidal uh, air cells. The anterior ethmoidal air cells are actually covered by. Uh, the lacrimal as well as frontal process of maxilla that is the lamina cribrosa that is the lacrimal bone here which is partially damaged and that is the frontal process of maxilla that foramen you see is the anterior ethmoidal foramen transmitting the anterior ethmoidal artery and that is the posterior ethmoidal foramen transmitting posterior ethmoidal artery and now this is a representation of the middle turbinate of the left nostril as you can see here, it, it can be divided into three parts. Anterior one-third directed sagittally, middle one-third directed coronally, and posterior one-third which has a horizontal orientation. The anterior one-third is actually articulating at the skull base at the region of middle and lateral lamella in the cribriform plate. The middle one-third or the basal lamella is actually attached to the lamina papyracea and the posterior or the horizontal part is also articulating with the lamina papyracea laterally. This is middle turbinate on the right side. As you can see the anterior part is directed sagittally. Middle part we have the basal lamella which is directed coronally and the horizontal portion which is seen posteriorly. The, anterior, the ethmoidal air cells which are anterior to basal lamella are anterior ethmoidal air cells and those posterior are the posterior ethmoidal air cells. The anterior ethmoidal air cells mainly consists of ethmoidal bulla, agar nasi, Uncinate process and Haller cells. Posterior ethmoidal cells are 1 to 7 in numbers and Onodoy cells is one of an important posterior ethmoidal cells. Here we are removing the middle turbinate and once we remove one can appreciate the presence of uncinate process which is sickle shaped prominence in the lateral wall and the middle meatus. Just posterior to it we have an air cell called as the bulla ethmoidalis which is a prominent and constant anterior ethmoidal air cell. And the two-dimensional space that is present between them is called as the hiatus semilunaris.
and a three dimensional space within it is called as the infundibulum this is endoscopic representation of the same and this is the left nostril on the medial side we have the uncinate process and bulla ethmoidalis and as one goes even more posteriorly one can see the lateral turn of the middle terminate which is called as a ground lamella or the basal lamella and that would be the uncinate process and bulla ethmoidalis within the middle meatus here i have reflected cut and reflected the uncinate process and one can appreciate the opening of maxillary sinus ostium there so hence it is necessary to open uncinate process in order to view the maxillary sinus so the combination of uncinate process bulla ethmoidalis and the infundibulum forms the ostiomeatal complex which is vital for the drainage of frontal maxillary and anterior ethmoidal region this is the diagram of ostiomeatal unit you have bulla ethmoidalis middle turbinate and the uncinate process the two dimensional space as i told earlier is the hiatus semilunaris and the three dimensional space is the infundibulum the uncinate process shows a variation in its attachment mainly in the superior uh, orientation the inferior attachment is constant and it is attached to the inferior turbinate superiorly at times it can be attached to lamina papyracea then the frontal sinus will drain lateral to it at times it can be attached to the cribriform plate in such cases it will drain into the infundibulum and in rare circumstances it can be attached to the middle turbinate as well as you can see in this diagram i have opened the uncinate process and hence one can appreciate the maxillary sinus ostium laterally the frontal recess is actually a, has an r glazed shape and anteriorly it is bounded by the agar nasi cells posteriorly we have the bulla ethmoidalis and that would be the frontal ostium the uncinate process within the middle meatus can be appreciated here and one can find anterior ethmoidal artery in the anterior wall at the skull base though the medial wall is not seen here it is contributed by the lamina papyracea and laterally we have the middle turbinate and whole of the frontal sinus drains along the middle meatus lateral to the uncinate process most commonly we all know that the air cells that are present behind the ground lamella are posterior ethmoidal air cells they have a pyramidal shape and their apex is directed posteriorly and they are located superolateral to the sphenoid sinus so in order to reach the posterior ethmoidal air cells it is necessary that we cut open the ground lamella it is usually open infero medially and the medial margin is kept intact and as you open the ground lamella we can see lamina papyracea beautifully on the lateral side and the posterior ethmoidal air cells when opened have a pyramidal shape with apex directed posteriorly one can differentiate it from the sphenoid sinus ostium because sphenoid cell opening sorry as uh, the sphenoid sinus inside has an appearance of a rounded uh, pot a ridge that runs behind the maxillary sinus ostium also helps to differentiate one above it is the posterior ethmoidal air cells and the opening below it or the sinus below it is the sphenoid sinus if we remove the lamina papyracea laterally one can enter into the orbit and we can appreciate the orbital fat and the medial rectus within it just to summarize the drainage of various sinuses here we have the frontal sinus draining into the middle meatus the sphenoid sinus draining into the sphenoethmoidal recess and uh, the maxillary sinus ostium opening in the middle meatus and the bulla ethmoidalis draining into the middle meatus at times when there is pneumatization of the posterior ethmoidal cells far more posteriorly it forms the onodi cells which are in close proximity with the sphenoid sinus and are in close uh, relation with uh, vital structures like optic nerve nasal septum is actually uh, formed by three important components we have the columella membranous septum and the septum proper as shown in this diagram that would be the columella in the middle we have the membranous septum and then we have the septum proper which consists of a perpendicular plate of ethmoid vomer which is a separate bone then there is a quadrilateral cartilage between them called as the septal cartilage and uh, contributions from crust of nasal bone nasal spine of frontal bone rostrum of sphenoid crusts of maxilla and palatine bone
and finally nasal spine of the maxillary bone also contribute to the septum blood supply is both by internal and external carotid arteries internal carotid artery supplies through anterior ethmoidal artery and posterior ethmoidal artery uh, the external carotid artery mainly gives the maxillary artery which supplies through the greater palatine artery and the sphenopalatine artery the facial branches facial artery branches also provide in a blood supply to the uh, septum there is a kisselback plexus formed between the anterior ethmoidal sphenopalatine and the superior labial artery which is the most common site of epistaxis whenever there is a trans nasal approach we need hadart flap for uh, skull base reconstruction and it is based uh, out of the sphenopalatine artery it is a pedicle flap as you can see here which is taken uh, the incision is placed uh, in the floor near the nasal spine Mm, and superiorly the incision is placed 1 to 2 cm below the roof to protect the olfactory epithelium and a subperichondrial and subperiosteal dissection is done and it is usually kept in the coana and is used later at times the septum can be deviated to one side and the roomy area can have hypertrophied inferior turbinate and all these has to be considered before uh, planning transnasal approaches now i'll quickly take you through uh, the nose with an endoscope as we enter the right nostril we first see the inferior turbinate uh, laterally and the nasal septum medially as we further proceed one can appreciate coana inferior and middle turbinate and septum on the medial side if we go above the coana we will find the sphenoethmoidal recess and around 1 to 1.5 cm above the coana one can appreciate the presence of uh, sphenoid ostium and it is at this level that the sphenopalatine artery comes out of the sphenopalatine foramen and gives two branches the posterior nasal branch which supplies the turbinates and the nasopalatine branch which supplies the septum a hadart flap is taken at this stage of the surgery and the septum is removed in the middle in the posterior part to expose the sphenoidal process and the two ostium can be seen here and the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus is drilled to enter into the sphenoid sinus so sphenoid sinus is actually an important structure that forms a relation with important neurovascular structures around it it shows nematization posteriorly and a well nematized sphenoid sinus is called cella type which can extend up to the clivus the second type of nematization is called as the precellar type where uh, the nematization does not extend beyond a plane along the anterior wall of the cella then third type is called as the conchal type where the entire cella is covered by a solid block of bone underneath and around it it is usually seen in children less than 12 years of age the depth of the sphenoid sinus is actually the distance between the ostium of the sphenoid sinus and the nearest cellar wall and it ranges between 12 to 23 mm septations within the sphenoid sinus show a number of variation as you can see in this diagram the section is taken at this uh, point in the sphenoid sinus and the septum can be seen oriented in different direction usually we have one major septum which divides the cavity into unequal parts sphenoid sinus has an anterior wall posterior wall floor and two lateral walls the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus actually consists of the sphenoid crust in the midline the rostrum of the sphenoid inferiorly and superolaterally we have the opening of the sphenoid ostium here as one goes far more laterally then can appreciate the presence of um, sphenoid concha which articulates with the ethmoid bone here a portion of the sphenoid sinus has been opened to give you an orientation as one enter inside we can see uh, important prominences in the sphenoid sinus they are the carotid and the optic prominence the and superior wall is actually formed by the planum as well as the cellular wall and uh, posteriorly we have the clival recess a number of prominences can be seen out of which one is 
tuberculum research which corresponds to the tuberculum cell on the opposite side uh, medially we have the medial optico carotid recess and laterally in between the optic nerve and the carotid artery we have the lateral optico carotid recess in between the cella and the carotid artery prominence we have the carotico cellar prominence these recesses give us an idea about the structures that are present on the other side of the sinus that is uh, the distal dural ring can be seen extending about 1 mm above and lateral to the tuberculum recess and at the level of tuberculum recess one can imagine the attachment of diaphragma cella the lateral carotid optic recess is a triangular structure and it corresponds to the optic strut on the other side this optic strut is actually a bony uh, attachment between the body of the sphenoid as well as the anterior crinoid process it separates the optic canal from the superior orbital fissure the proximal dural ring extends from the optico carotid recess to the midline and this segment would be the clinoidal segment of the carotid artery one can also appreciate the presence of optico chiasmatic sulcus just above the tubercular recess here the same can be seen in the articulated skull here on the other side that would be the opto chiasmatic sulcus that is the tuberculum cella and that is the planum sphenoidal as you can see in this table the least thickness of the sphenoid sinus wall is along the anterior wall of the cella the lateral wall uh, as the carotid artery passes through the foramen and enters the skull base uh, one can see its pathway through the carotid sulcus along the body of the sphenoid this forms a prominence on the other side of the sphenoid sinus and that gives rise to the carotid prominence that is seen within the sphenoid sinus in a well nematized uh, sphenoid sinus one can appreciate three different uh, parts of the carotid artery that is rather three segments of the carotid artery they are the retrocellular infracellular and precellar the precellar is seen in 98% of the people and infracellar in 80% and retrocellar in 78% the shortest bit distance between the carotid is seen between the tubercular cella this is how the optic nerve passes through the optic canal and one can imagine its relationship along the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus it passes into the optic canal and forms an optico carotid recess which corresponds to the optic strut on the other side there are various other uh, nerves as well that passes uh, along the lateral wall the third and the fourth nerve though they pass lateral to the carotids but however it is the fifth nerve and uh, within the fifth nerve it is the maxillary division of the fifth nerve as is pa as it passes through the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus just anterior to the retrocellular segment of the carotid artery it forms prominence along the lateral wall in the inferior aspect it can be damaged while operating in this corridor the floor of the sphenoid sinus is mainly related to the median canal this is the median canal and that would be the median nerve Uh, the median nerve passes through the median canal to appreciate to appear in front of the sphenoid body and it goes into the sphenopalatine fossa or the pterygopalatine fossa and joins the pterygopalatine ganglia this is the floor of the sphenoid sinus axial cut seen from above to one can see the floor of the sphenoid sinus separated from the maxillary sinus by the pterygopalatine fossa that is the median canal that is running towards the petrous part of the carotid artery a coronal ct is shown here shows the presence of median canal so quickly revising through an endoscopic video as we enter into the uh, left nasal cavity we have the inferior turbinate the first structure that we see as we trace it posteriorly 1 cm behind it we have the eustachian tube opening as you can see here 
that is the fossa of Rosenmuller. Then as we peep into the inferior meatus, one has to see the nasolacrimal duct close to the apex of the inferior turbinate, that is the nasolacrimal duct with Hasner's valve around it. That is again the middle turbinate with the uncinate process within it. As we trace the middle turbinate posteriorly, one can easily reach the coana and about one centimeter above it is the sphenoid ostium. That is the uncinate process in the middle meatus. Here we can see the attachment of um, middle turbinate to the lateral wall. That is the accessory ostium of the maxillary bone, maxillary sinus, sorry. That is the uncinate process and that is the bulla ethmoidalis within the middle meatus. The uncinate process is being cut in order to see the structure within it clearly. That is the bulla ethmoidalis. And as we remove this bulla ethmoidalis, we enter into the basal lamella. As you can recall this structure that I showed, this is the basal lamella directed coronally and behind it we have the horizontal portion. The same can be appreciated here, that is the basal lamella, the vertical part and that is the horizontal portion, both of them being attached to the lamina papyracea laterally. Cutting opening the ground lamella or the basal lamella, we enter into the posterior ethmoidal cells. One can see the posterior ethmoidal artery at the skull base there. As we proceed further, we enter into the sphenoid sinus inferomedially. That is the sphenoid sinus being opened laterally, that is the optic nerve. That is the carotid prominence. And here we are able to see the maxillary sinus ostium clearly. Now I would like to show you how a sphenoid sinus would look if we approach it through the sphenoid sinus ostium. First we trace the coana and about one centimeter above the coana is the sphenoid ostium over there. We do a hard flap and cut the septum and we expose the ostium on either side that is the rostrum of the sphenoid in the midline that ridge that you are seeing. Then we drill the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus to enter into the sphenoid sinus. Here we see a number of prominence as I explained earlier. That is the clival rhesus, that is the retrocellar carotid, infracellar carotid, precellar carotid and that is the optic prominence and that would be the lateral optical carotid rhesus. Thank you.